You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. Uh, go ahead and get started here. We have got Will from Civitas Learning. And Will, you've been at uh, Civitas in the CEO role for two years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, started there as a CTO. But uh, if I'm looking correct, about 20 years in total experience uh, working in a leadership in the technology space. Technology space, space yeah. Um, even almost, looked like almost nine years for uh, GLG in New York. And so I'd love to kind of, first off, just hear a little bit of how you transitioned not only out of New York to Austin, but then uh, took, a, took a year to trans, transition from the CTO role into CEO. Oh, sure. And probably the other way around. So GLG's headquarters in New York, uh, biggest office is actually here in Austin. Is it really? Okay. And so okay. I never actually moved to New York. I, just, I see. I just went a few days every week. Okay. So nice. there's no real, no, no big transition, except I don't have to travel anymore. Okay. Which is nice. kind of nice, because I did... Um, you know, between GLG and Demand Media before, I did 40 weeks a year on the road for 10 years. 40 weeks yeah, a year. Including like, you know, New York, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, LA. Like it was, there was just a lot of travel. I got like five lifetimes worth of travel packed in there. So Wow. Now, was that a, a determining factor in in moving away? Were you actively trying to, to leave there or, or was it kind of a... No, I went back in like the straight up software business. Like okay. I started off in the software business as a kid and did like startup and then more on the internet. GLG is like a really cool software enabled service, but it's not, it's not a software company. Yeah. And I wanted to get back into like plain old fashioned software. Okay. And so what was it in particular that, that led you to Civitas? Was it like a, a big major determining factor or could, maybe can kind of shed some light on what, what brought you there in the first place? Oh, so Civitas I'd actually known for a long time. In fact, I call it like fourth times a charm. Charles, the guy who's the originally the founding CEO, had recruited me to be CTO. It was maybe in thirteen, and maybe in fifteen, and like maybe again in the beginning. Of 18. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and I actually, my wife had made me swear off doing what she referred to as other people's startups. Okay. Um, but there was no rule against private equity deals, and so once it was actually transitioned out of being a startup, and we had uh, Francisco Partners in as a private equity sponsor then it was fair game again. And I'd always been interested in the problem space. Um, in particular, the using data to help students stay in school is a pretty cool problem to work on. Yeah, um, especially now. Yeah, especially now. Like, especially now in a world where there's a dwindling supply of students, so hanging on to the ones you got yeah. matters ever more. Wow, okay. So I do want to kind of skip back. Uh, one of our favorite questions that we ask everyone is what is the biggest mistake that you've ever made in leadership that you can think of throughout your career? I've got a pretty expensive one. So <laughs> I'm about 26 years old, first time I was VP of engineering. Um, we got the product in market, you know, startup right around dot com crash. There were some good spots, there were some bad spots, but we got it working and it was in market and I got bored. So I quit to go do something else and you okay. know, cashed out. I uh, had about 4% of the company and uh, it sold for a billion five four years later. Yeah. Wow. Whoops. Happens. Yeah. That missed out on a, a couple bucks there. Missed out, missed out on a few bucks there. Yeah. And so thinking of, of that particular one, what was the next role that you stepped into following that? Oh, I, I uh, did a little bit of consulting for a while and then ended up running technology at uh, Pluck, which we sold into demand media and then took that public in what 2010. Okay. All right. Or 2011, 2011. All right. Now it looked like as I was kind of learning all about you and, and looking at all the different experience you've got over the years, it looked like, I mean, it was very heavy technology CTO. Mm-hmm. So how, tell me about the transition into CEO itself. I mean, how did, how did that come about? Is that something that you were actively looking at or it just kind of happened? A- or? Actively interested in, um, and a friend of mine who was CEO of Civitas for about a year and a half. Um, he was, uh, he was mostly, he took a job to get out of the house and set a good example for his kids, the way he describes it. Okay. Um, he didn't need a job by any stretch of the imagination. And then COVID hit. So his plan was ruined because he wasn't getting out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I took the spot. Backfired. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It backfired on him. Like I was, uh, I was always interested in being CEO. I actually thought 
particularly because Civitas is actually quite small compared to GLG. There's this is the way some of this stuff works. It's like you move up an executive level, you got to move way down a company size level in almost every case. Like sure. I know almost nobody who hasn't had that happen. Um, so I figured it was a good place to make that kind of transition. Plus it is a pretty technical business. Like it's, it's data and data feeds and data science and software engineering. So yeah. And that, that was a kind of a curiosity yeah. I had too, is what does that look like in practicality? Kind of a, what I, the question I wrote down was like a, a CTO's brain now in that CEO seat, it feels like you're uniquely prepared, but what are, what are some of the, maybe the bigger challenges that you're dealing with, not only in the role, but maybe the company as a whole right now? Um, more on the, the role has more sales responsibility than like I've done most other functions. I actually have done a lot of digital marketing and marketing to demand media and actually GLG and facilities and technology and operations and effectively all the back office stuff and the building the product and product management functions. Uh, the sales one's tricky because higher ed in particular has an extremely long sales cycle. Sure. Like, okay. like three quarters to a year is the average time. Wow. So you can't like find a sales lead in January and get a sale in March. You can find a sales lead in January and you get a sale the next January. Yeah, like yeah. That's how it goes. So I feel sometimes in my analogy is like, like imagine I'm running a shipping company and it's like 1650 and I like put the rum on the ship and I send it <laughs> and it'll get there and then it'll come back with money and it's just going to be a really long time. So we have to, we have to have a very you know large pipeline, large number of deals. And that's been something we've adjusted to every other business I've been in has had extremely short sales cycles. So your ability to like figure out what the problem is, fix it, pivot, innovate, you get a lot more feedback. When your feedback is a year long, it's learning goes a little slow. Yeah. yeah. And, now, that, and that was like, I just finished talking to another CEO this morning who's the first time CEO, software business, higher ed. It's like, it's like I found my long lost brother. We had the exact same problem. It was like hilarious. Wow. Uh, here so, in town? Here in town. Yeah. Everybody I talked to. Okay. Everybody I talked to has like, they love the space, love the problem, hate the, how long the sales cycle yeah. is. Yeah. And it is, why is that? I mean, is it mostly dealing with like municipalities and the no, government? No, it's, it's government adjacent a lot of times and then some government overlay. So like there's a lot of public, public funded institutions. Um, they're, they're really big institutions. So whether they were public or private, big institutions don't have super fast uh, purchasing cycles. Sure. And then there's oftentimes grants and government funding and uh, committees and then another yeah. committee. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then higher ed... It, like sort of like spiritually runs on semesters. Like it runs on semesters. Like yeah. It's going to take a while. Yeah. Okay. So as you're like looking back over the last two years, I mean, you, you accepted the role as CEO smack dab in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. Like were y'all fully remote at this time? Were, I mean, how, I want to kind of hear about the, the culture, not only when you came into it, but what does the, the company culture look like right now? Are y'all, have y'all kind of gotten back into the office and whatnot? No, I went the opposite direction. We're, uh, we're distributed and actually have been all along because Civitas has multiple acquisitions it made over the years. So we've got folks in India, we've got folks in South America, we've got folks in California, we've got folks okay, here in okay. Austin. Like, originally it thought of itself, Civitas, and framed itself as like a company, as an Austin company. It was never really was never really true. Like the, like half the employees were always somewhere else. The, Interesting. The, the so it was already like that. It was already distributed. What we did have is a staggering amount of office space. Um, we actually had enough office space in Austin to probably seat 200 people if other people were doing wow. it and 400 people if we did it like we did facilities at GLG. Um, and like, I was joking with my employees. I'm like, hey, I'm looking at the rent bill that I you know inherited here. And like, it's literally enough for me to pay everybody's mortgage. Like it was wow. crazy. I mean, not that, you know, mortgages all cost different amounts. So it's sort of an average. Um, so we got rid of all the office space. All sub, of it. Sublet it in probably May 21. So a couple of years ago now. And then use that money to actually, we use that money to pay for inflation adjustment raises for everybody in 21. So that was a big hit. Like, wow. hey, not, not wasting money on rent, get to work from home, everybody gets a raise. Like that was a, that was a pretty good combo. Holy shit. Um, you should write a book about but that. If I could, well, it's, it'd only be like three paragraphs long though. Cause there's not, I mean, yeah. here's this book, do, do this. <laughs> Um, I love that though. It, yeah, it, it worked really well. I mean, it was sort of a, in a sense of victimless crime that, you know, the, the space got sublet to a company who wanted to be in person and we didn't and didn't really need it. Wow. Um, so folks how, are trying to get rid of office space now. It's much harder. I heard, uh, what was the journal Monday? There's 200 million feet on the market for sublet up from 
like a hundred million is like kind of the nominal average. Wow. Yeah. Bad time to sublet. So right now, no office space at all. Everything is 100% remote and yet on Glassdoor, do you, are you the kind of guy that looks at Glassdoor ratings and that Don't kind of look. stuff? Yeah. Okay. Megan, Megan, uh, who runs uh, HR has looked from time to time, but no, I swore, okay. it off, swore it off years ago. All right. So I hope it's okay to tell you. So mm-hmm. Civitas as a company has four and a half star rating cool. out of five. Mm-hmm which is solid, right? But then you as CEO, I don't know if you know this, 100% rating. Yep, strange. And so <laughs> I mean I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't take a sell uh, it's not a scientific poll, right? It's self-selected bit of respondents and well thanks to everybody who said nice things, but sure, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't read too much into that. At GLG we actually had like our glass door rating as part of the executive bonus formula. We had a board member who was um, interesting. very interested in that. Yeah. But yeah, I swore it off after that. Okay, okay. Well, to me, when I, I see that, because every time we have someone on the show, of course, that's something that we're looking at. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to find all that I can to figure out who this person is and, and what I want to talk about or learn about, whatnot. And when I see that, I mean, that's a, that's a huge green flag, right? Wow, like enough people at this company, but it wasn't like when you see a Was pro- it more than two people? 19, 19 people. Oh, yeah, that's quite a few, yeah. Right? We only so, have like 130 people. Okay, so when I look at, you know, say an Amazon thing and it says it 4,000 ratings, I mean, that's a red flag. I'm like, come on, you're telling me 4,000 people bought this product and then they also yeah. gave mm-hmm. a review. So I, I see 19 people in the last two years. I mean, that's, that's impressive. So what you just talked about with the office space is, is huge and that mm-hmm. definitely makes sense. So are there other things that y'all are doing to, to like actively increase, you know, maybe retention or uh, improve the company culture that you can point to? Yeah. The other one is we've been um, not only doing employee surveys, but setting them up as like actionable employee surveys and then actually doing the thing. For example, we had, when we do benefits, we list out like, here's all the benefits changes we could make this year. This is how much money we've got. Everybody like rank choice vote what items you want. And then we were picking based on that. So having wow. everybody included in the, the benefits decision, uh, and you know, so, and some people, you know, not everybody agrees. Like there's some real outliers, sure. like even in getting rid of the office space. I remember we did a poll of like, Hey, is everybody cool with getting rid of the office space and working from home? And like four people voted against it <laughs> Okay, and they were really bent out of shape about it. Wow. Like I had, I had one, one, one of the guys arguing with me. He was like, I get along with him really well, but he's arguing with me that like, well, we really needed to have the office space. And I'm like, well, 126 of us said no. Like, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but he, he's like, and he's like, but I bought an apartment close to the office. So I go to the office. I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, now you have extra money to pay, yeah, no, you have extra money to pay your rent. Yeah. It's so like, you can't make like, even stuff that's like wildly popular is never like completely popular. Yeah. yeah. So what you were just talking about with the, the change in benefits. So I'm mm-hmm. assuming y'all just did that in the fall for 2023. Yeah, we did fall for 2023 this year. Um, the bigger changes, we actually, we've just been swapping around our health insurance. We've been, uh, a- actively shopping for better healthcare plan deals and like passing that savings through to uh, the employees. We didn't make such a big change. Nothing big this year. Big okay. This year. Last year, w- the big one we came up with is the um, choose your own adventure fund. So it's like, a, it's almost like an old school expense account where we put, I think the, at the moment it's 300 bucks a month per employee. We put into an expense account that they can use for kind of whatever, like home office or for the, for the folks who really want office space, that's that's like enough money to subscribe to like WeWork or something like that, yeah. like an all access pass. So folks who want to get together and have office space together can, they just do it on their own. Uh, folks who want to buy a new chair, paint their office and set up their home office can, they just do it on their own or pay for their cell phone or uh, internet bill, however they want to go about it. Wow. And it's tax advantage because it's business expense. So it's like, it's actually like 500 bucks. Like yeah. if you think about the, I do tax math in my head all the time. Okay. Family full of tax people. So not getting yeah. taxed on that. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually works out pretty well. No, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, another question that just popped into my mind mm-hmm. is, is you had mentioned this other CEO, your, your long lost brother, you mm-hmm. referred to him as you don't have to share now. Are you, do you feel comfortable sharing who that was in that company? If not, we can talk about it offline, but, Oh yeah. I was talking to, uh, Joe at top hat. Uh, this morning, okay. and I, I hadn't met him before, like an investment banker that we both know in common. Okay, introduced us. That's awesome. Because yeah. when I hear that, of course, my brain goes to, "Well, now I want to have him on yeah. the, on the <laughs> podcast as well." That's fantastic. So, 
one thing I want to talk about here is um, looking at the, the core values for Civitas. Now, the current set of core values, it looks like there were four of them on the website. Did you have anything to do with that? Were those already set in place when you arrived as CTO? Um, no, those actually were those were arrived at collectively as an exercise with the folks like Megan, um, actually ran more of that. So I haven't done the, um, I'm not a, the values are what I say they are a person. And actually like, neither is Megan. She's more in the values are what we see they are. Okay. And so those we came at more by observation and said, Hey, here's what we're seeing. Does everybody agree with these? As opposed to wow, thou shalt have these values. Um, I've always seen the whole like mission vision values exercise is like way top down most yeah. places. Oh yeah. As opposed to like, recognizing what's there and what people do or don't like. So, so what, did y'all, was there still a process that, uh, how y'all observed those and, and came to that? Um, Megan compiled a list of all the things that she had heard and had everybody vote on them. Okay. Uh, so That's it's awesome. like people like, Hey, like, not, and, and she weighted it a little bit in how she talked about it. So, cause like you can get into the like aspirational side as opposed to the actual side. And she yeah. worded it in a way that like nudged people to nudge people to answer the actual. Okay. So. No, that's fantastic. So as I just want to read these off. Mission critical, curious and courageous, precision, and one I've never seen, grace of space. So when you hear those four, is there one particular one or maybe even a couple of them? That- the grace of space one might be, I can't remember the, how we got in the wording on that one. Um, the precision one comes out from like the fact that we're dealing with, with data a lot. Sure. Um, and these might actually, that version of it might be a little bit uh, older. Are you pulling that from my like, current website or did you get that from a while back? Um, I do believe that was on the current, the current website. One? Yeah. Pull those there. Yeah. Those do fit, but the, the precision one. Um, so like, what are we really doing? We're collecting data from what's student information system, the SIS, which is like the main database that schools keep all the information about enrollment in students and the LMS, the learning management system where students go in and do, coursework like they view the content and do quizzes and, and whatnot getting that data into our system and then analyzing and then predicting which students are at risk it the precision matters because it's like it's like real people's lives and outcomes of course, and yeah. so we talk about like you know, people debate like whether it's worth going to college or not i'll leave that to them to decide that's their business uh but what i'm real sure of is like going to college and not finishing is not in anybody's interest in fact like folks who don't finish have a three times default rate on their student loans which is not it's mm. not it's not great like having not the full degree doesn't give you the credential but you, you get left with the loan anyway it's not yeah. it's not a great scenario so helping schools help students get all the way to done matters and having the data be right, having it be in there and uh, dialing that in is part of what we're doing all the time. So checking, there's like constant data QA and data checking. Um, and school systems have large numbers of users and lots of people changing and messing with them all the time. Um, like you can imagine like big, big organizations, lar- relatively large IT demands on it. There's changes that get requested and made and they're not, they don't always work so great with each other. Yeah. And we're downstream of all that. So, you know, in any given day, somebody's busted something and we're, hunting it down with yeah. the customer fixing because we're dependent on their data in order to analyze and come back. So like that part of the kind of constant, constant correcting and feeding data back in is part of what we're doing. Wow. And so right now company wide, you're saying about 130 employees Yeah. and not to get like super into the weeds, but I'm curious kind of a breakdown of the, the number of people on the different teams. Oh, it's, um, we have multiple different categories of engineers, but it's about, uh, Gosh, we're about a third sales, like okay. sales, and, sales and marketing, like uh, go to market functions, about a quarter uh, product. So like engineers and product managers like building yep. um, and about a quarter um, support. In, so like, in, and it's not just support, it's like support data engineering. Like these folks are all engineers. They're either. They aren't building, but they're maintaining. Well, sometimes and they are building. Yeah. Okay. Like, Cause like the, the data feed data feed coming in from customers can get customized each time. So there's a building component to it. So there's people who like build the shared product and there's people who build the per customer product and there's people who uh, fix and repair and support. And then folks who customize it for individual schools, like schools actually customize things quite a bit. Yeah. And then there's, you know, normal GNA overhead like me. Okay. Wow. That is fascinating. <laughs> Cause I, I think of, you know, companies I've worked in of that size where you might have, you know, a, a little small office, not much bigger than this room and you have four developers in there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, hearing a, a, essentially half the company are in some sort of a technical role. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're, 
relatively more engineers yeah. um, than most software companies our size, and that's the that's mostly about the, the sort of customization and like maintenance and data feed component that's going on. So it's not just like write software, put it in a box, sure, send it on to CompUSA, like, yeah. like I did as a kid at Quarterdeck. But um, wow, so that's it's it's a little bit more engineer heavy. Yeah, and so of of those people, like, are they? on the data side, is it just kind of like a, a queue that comes in or, or is it like, okay, this is your account and any feedback that they have or so any both. So, um, for deployment, so deployment engineers, data engineers, um, they actually, they'll pull or pick a customer as they come in. And then we've been working on, um, work in process limits. Like one of the things the company used to do is like, there'd be like a big pile of work and then people would have six or eight or 10 customers they're working on. It was just no fun. Yeah. So now we aim for two. So when you're working on getting a customer installed, you've got, ideally it's two. Sometimes there'll be a little transition. It'll go higher or lower, but then people can actually focus on helping getting that customer live on the support side to queue where we're, we try really hard to be first come first serve to get okay. customer issues as they come in. We've got priority rules. Like if it's like, we'll call it really broken. Um, yeah, yeah. It goes to the head of the line. If it's not quite so broken, we do them first come first serve. Sure. And so that like both of those are in play. Okay. And you, you mentioned the, the seriously long sales cycle. Mm. So then I think about that and kind of hearing all of the customization that goes into it. So I'm a school, we've, we're now a year into this process. We mm -hmm. finally said yes. From the time we say yes, I've given you my money or whatever. When, when are we going live? Like what's, what's that onboarding process look like for you guys? Oh, okay. So this is actually very dependent on the school. Like we have done as quick as six weeks. Wow. We've done as long as a year and a half. Um, it's, you know, fun things will happen. Like you'll set off a project with somebody and they'll go to another school and then a whole <laughs> yeah. new, and then like a whole new committee will have to form. Oh no. That takes a while. Like that's a, that's a surefire way to add a year to the process. We've had that happen a couple of times yeah. here recently. Um, but mostly it gets done in the three to six month time frame, or like a semester is, yeah. is pretty typical for, for what happens. Okay. That sounds pretty fast for what you're it, doing. It's actually pretty fast. Like I, I talked to a lot of folks who do relatively complicated installations and deployment and, uh, higher ed software. And we're, we're pretty good at it. Like we're, we're pretty good at it. So one, one question that I have is, is kind of thinking about having a team that's that high percentage of people working on a technical end. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the unique challenges that you guys have experienced with that kind of employee makeup? And I can kind of go a little more into that if yeah, you want. Yeah, go but. a little bit because I, yeah, like I don't find that act. I actually that's the part I don't find challenging, and I know I, I know a lot of CTO types. I know they, that's they why do, I'm so I'm like, interested. Ah, doesn't phase me. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I'm I, I really like it's it's so fascinating knowing that yeah someone with your unique skill set and experience is leading this team. So on when you think maybe about your executive team, mm -hmm. are there are most of those people more on the technical side? I mean, of course you have no, it's some that are in it's sales. it's pretty balanced. But. I mean, we have like, we have two VPs of engineering. So we, because we've, we've acquired multiple products and there's two major product lines. So there's okay. a little bit more there than, than you'd see in a typical company our size. Head of product. Um, so there's really three super, like, you know, classically what people would think of technical folks. Uh, my COO, Emiliano, who actually worked with GLG, he's he's actually a mechanical engineer by training and programs to, wow. you know, build models and simulate stuff. So like the, the, there's a, you know, relatively technical, relatively technical management team, but you know, we have marketing and sales and HR and, you know, legal and account management and finance that are not, you know, none of them are none at all. Programmers. Yeah. They'll, they'll finance any more Excel programming, but that's, it's programming. People, yeah. just don't, people just don't admit it. Right. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. And so like when you think about, just the, the culture that y'all have been able to not only build, but maintain over these last few years. I mean, can you think of uh, any, any specific things that you would say were the biggest, I don't know, components or big drivers, um, being remote and committing to it. Um, like a lot of companies have been super wishy washy on like, are we remote or aren't we remote or we have office space or come back to the office space. Yeah. And, then, and then someone looks at the budget and goes, Oh, we're spending so much money on office space. People ought to use it. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, hang on that. You get the logic backwards right? there. Yeah. That's a um, 
that that's been going on in a lot of companies has been painful for a lot of folks, but actually just like, Hey, we got rid of the office space, yeah. I, but I had, you know, even the year after the office space, I had an employee ask me, Hey, are, are we ever going to have to go back to the office? And I'm like, man, I got rid of the office space. And yeah, I spent all the money. So like, no, like yeah. he's like, great. Cause I was, he was kind of worried cause he had friends that they made them go back to the office. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's been a relatively big one for, cause at this point, particularly cause it's remote new folks that have come in like that, those are the, those are the ground rules we're at right now. Um, the other one is, is like relatively high levels. They're actually quite high levels when I think about realistically what other people do of like inclusivity of folks in the decision making process and being involved in, um, at, at every level at or? really every level like like one thing we've been doing more of this is something that I kind of randomly invented that's worked out pretty well is uh, for our all hands meetings I was just about to ask yeah. you I'll do stuff like that yeah we've got like kind of the normal here's the news stuff like hey here's the new people and oh here's the new deals we sold and like oh here's the customers that renewed yay um, and oh are there updates to compensation or benefits but the other one we're doing is like a problem solving exercise like brainstorming session like hey I've got this question or problem we need to solve break up into random teams on zoom and everyone as a team come back with suggested answers and, and like exercises that oftentimes teams, I was watching the, my sales team do this at sales training yesterday, like breaking up into small teams and like problem solving. It's kind of a natural thing to do at the small team level, but at the company level. Yeah. And that's pretty fun. So you're saying whole companies on 130 people on and y'all still split up and do break stuff up like into that. sixes and tens and okay. come back and then everyone reads out what they thought of, which is way better than listening to me talk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Like, so it's way better for me too because I don't have to make up half an hour of junk. So when I think of of that too, I also think of like, yeah, I, I feel like I would still miss the human interaction. Like some it, folks it, do. Yeah. Have y'all done like, hey, we're all going to come to Austin for a an uh, event kind of thing to still Scottsdale, get everyone together? I don't know how I don't know how Scottsdale got picked, but it was Scottsdale last okay. fall. So uh, there was a uh, all get together but you know typical of me did it as an you know as an opt-in thing like hey if you want to uh, go great go if you don't want to go like i'm not going to make you play company how like, many people came to that uh, 50 60 okay so it was about what i expected it was about 50 50 when it was all said and done yeah um because there's people who want to do that and there's people who don't care at all they just want you know work hard do a good job yeah. enjoy talking to people at work or online and then they want to go be with their family or do their hobby and letting people choose whether they sure. want to be involved in it respects both those points of view. Yeah. Um, the sales get together we had yesterday and is going on today. It's a little different in that like there's a kind of training component. So that, that one's a little more, I'll call it mandatory. Um, sales folks usually are not quite so introverted though. My head of sales openly admits he is. So he's like, yeah, he, you know, he's not hundred percent into big get togethers, but he does them cause he realizes everybody else wants to. Yep. Yep. No, that's, I, I definitely, <laughs> have felt that throughout yeah. my sales career. So do you know right now, you don't have a, have a specific number, but like how many customers are y'all at right now? Oh, just under 400. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're relatively big installation footprint, uh, in the U S and between the different product lines, like I'd say about a quarter of students use our software to schedule and register for their classes in the U S each term. Wow. And probably 10 or 15% of students, are assisted by our uh, models or, or like, and it's this much the student is, is the advisors and the faculty and the administration gets data on who to go, who to go help and assist. It's not really a student self-serve. It's, yeah. it's, it's more aimed at the institution. So as y'all, y'all are planning or thinking of the future, do y'all, I mean, what's, what's the next five, 10 years look like for y'all? I mean, y'all trying to take over America. And- <laughs> no, no, it's the, the market is not, the market's really not that, big so that okay. there's no real there's no real space for that over the next five to ten years we're we're really doing what we're doing and, and rolling it out and scaling it across uh, more customers um the big new pieces of like functionality and technology we're focused on are we had a couple of names for them, but then this is more jargony higher ed stuff course demand analytics so if you're a big school like and some people went to a big school some people went to a small school but if you went to a big school like particularly like california schools you have like a course but it's not just a course. There's sections of the course and there's lots of sections of the course with lots of students in each one of them. And so as a student navigating through essentially the maze of the schedule in order to get to your degree can be really hard. 
Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's just like there's it, so what we're trying to do is give students in schools visibility into the academic plans that all their students have in order to get to their degree so that they can actually schedule courses in sections each term that closely match the demand their students actually have in order to get to their degrees. Cause like right now the algorithm that like effectively every school uses to pick their schedule is what did we do last year? Yeah. Is our enrollment up or down? Let's scale it up or down by that. And so and it's, it's really like, it's that kind of course. And you think about it like, well, that's kind of dumb. Like, well, it's not really dumb cause I got thousands of courses and sections to do. So like, what else are you going to do? Yeah. Um, but because it's just, it's just a lot of data. So we're building a machine learning model that works on that. And I did this, um, I did not quite the same thing, but awfully close in about 1995 for uh, San Bernardino County uh, for K-12, not for the community okay. college or colleges there, where we, we built a program that was like, hey, here's all the students that are enrolled in San Bernardino. Cool. Here's all their schools. Here's all the courses they want to take. Here's all of our teachers. Uh, here's all of our union rules. Go. Like figure out like where to put the students. And it was a huge district, tens of thousands of students in the nineties. And it's actually even much bigger now, but like figuring that out and coming up with a good answer. Yeah. I remember like when I first wrote that software, I met him at you know, 21 or something. Um, so you're 21 years old and you just like, Hey, let me start yeah, writing just, all this code this. to and, build this. Yeah. And I, and I built the program and I gave it to him like, really sorry. It takes like three days to run. I'm sorry. It's so slow. And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. This took all summer every year since the dawn of time, we're going to get to take the summer off now. <laughs> like, this is great. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And you uh, just gave them that? <laughs> oh, no, I, I mean, we sold it to them. Okay. okay yeah, okay. it wasn't like, like a, it wasn't like, hold yeah, on. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. you were just giving this. No, one. no, okay. no. We're software. We're always right. It's software for money. Yeah. If it's worth doing, it's worth charging for. Yeah. Oh, that is fantastic. Mm-hmm. So I do want to go back. You had mentioned, you know, I asked about challenges mm-hmm. with such a, you know, a, a, a data tech heavy team. And you said, eh, not really experiencing. Not really, no. So when you, when you scan right now and you think of the challenges that y'all are currently facing, what would you say the biggest challenges that you, you are currently experiencing? You know, the real one is like, like predictability on the sales funnel. So in a world where like you, you have these really long sales cycle, like answering to investors of like which deals and how much revenue in yeah. any given time period is, is extraordinarily difficult. And like I've been on this quest to find other CEOs in the same space who have a better answer. Um, apparently other CEOs have been on this quest and they find me. I'm like, Oh, I was hoping you had the answer. And they're like, yeah. Oh, I was hoping you had the answer. I'm like, Oh darn. Um, and so that's been, that's been one thing we've been working on. The, the best we've arrived at there of everyone I've talked to is you need to have an extraordinarily large in terms of number of not, not so much dollar value, but like number of possibilities Yeah, yeah. because you can't really, forecast any one individual one in time in any meaningful way. So that one, that one's kind of hard because there's actually other businesses that are extremely predictable on demand and forecasting. Um, this higher education software sales is not predictable demand forecasting. So what, what do you, I mean, what tools do you have in place for the forecasting on the sales side? Um, Salesforce, so, you know, kind of same as everybody built yeah, the yeah. sales funnel, track the deals, track, track the dollar values, who's involved in it, what stage we're at. Uh, a lot of historical data crunching, few, uh, not quite machine learning models because the ends just not big enough. Uh, yeah. there, there's only like 4,000 schools in the U- U.S. that's the ends just not big enough to predict sales on, with a yeah. machine learning kind of setup. Um, so there's nothing super fancy going on. Upside is it's only 4,000 schools. You know exactly who they are. You know exactly who the executives yeah. are. So businesses where you've got this like mass prospecting because you're because you're essentially customer could be anybody. We don't have that problem. Yeah. We, we know exactly who everybody is. Um, we know who's interested in it. We can talk to them. The problem is the time frame. Yeah. yeah. So any, mm-hmm. any plans? I mean, you hearing about the team, it, it's clearly a global team. Mm-hmm. Any plans in the future of actually reaching out globally for new customers? Oh, or we, have, we have customers, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And are those kind of one-offs that, that, found you or were y'all mm, actively mm, selling into those actively selling in those markets? Oh, wow. uh, okay. It's th- those markets are n- not, honestly, they're just not that big. I mean like UK economy is maybe a little bigger than Texas. The Canada economy is probably yeah. a little smaller than Texas. Um, so that makes sense. They're just, they're just, they're their whole country and they're awesome and they're, you know, physically big and interesting, but the, there's not really huge markets there. Uh, and the, the dollar flows like the U S the higher education dollar flows are just, just plain bigger. Yeah. yeah. Now that makes sense. So 
um, when you think about the culture specifically, are there, are there challenges when you think just the culture, the completely remote work, what would the biggest challenges that you can think of uh, just around culture and kind of maintaining that? You know, I haven't found it really challenging, but that's also, so going back in time, like my very first management job was about 1997 Okay. at quarter deck. And I had, you know, a guy from Afghanistan and a guy from Lebanon and a guy from Korea and a guy from Buffalo, New York, and they were distributed and that was just how it was. And then, you know, then I got a job later where, oh, I was in the office there, but I'm like, oh, I guess this is a way to do it too. So being remote and working together and collaborating, whether it's in, you know, sort of primordial management experience or like working on open source projects or have friends around the world who have, you know, random problems to help each other with that. That's never really struck me as a, there's, there's no challenge or problem to solve there. Cause there's no challenge or problem. Yeah. There. feels like you've been doing that, been doing that it for a part long of it for time. so long. Like, yeah, it doesn't, it just doesn't even really face like, we, you know, we have all the normal, Hey, we have email and we have Slack and we have FaceTime and we have Zoom. like, there's like, there's so many communication channels. Like it might've been a little harder 20 something years ago when you like, had like what was it like Adium and ICQ and stuff, but it actually worked. Just, I mean, it's all, it's all yeah. the same stuff. Like it worked just as fine in 1997 as it does now. It just yeah. doesn't. It doesn't have a Giphy or anything fun. It was yeah. just text. You know, it was, it was just the text back then. Um, Which is probably better anyway, right? Well, it was easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you could tell, like tell he's really old because they like type and hit return all the time. And the and the the folks who've been doing it recently, they'll write whole paragraphs and hit return. I'm like, oh. You're yeah. Okay. That's like, yeah. A, that's a cultural change right there. Yeah, how, yeah. Many, how many times you hit return per paragraph? Yeah. No, I love that. Mm. I, cause when I think about, I mean, even the, the last time I worked for, you know, a big company mm-hmm. and, and I'm not joking, we had a room about this size and there was a, a cube in there and I think they were four to six developers. There was no phone. They're like, and if, if, if it was like the world is coming to an end and I have, to, I have a dig get up and go and talk to them and then they would give me whatever and then I would relay that to the customer. So I think of that, I'm like, oh wow, okay. I could see a large group of developers, technical people that they're yeah, this is my sweet spot. I'm oh, in, yeah. I'm in yeah. my home space and I'm doing what I love and then I just communicate the way I always and on have. their own time. Yeah. So the and you know people have real divided opinions about this and there's not the uh, I'll call it like sociology and psychology studies on like office space or not. Yeah. You can find one that says whatever you want. In sure, fact, sure. You can, you can <laughs> yeah. find 50% of them say whatever you want. Sure, sure. That, Cause there's really no, con- no conclusive evidence either way or the other. Um, I, I, I will say the developers like, Hey, I'm working on what I'm working on and I'm interrupted when I choose to be interrupted as opposed to when someone else chooses to interrupt me and working remote, and in a messaging oriented asynchronous workflow, people can enforce their boundaries Yeah. in an office space. You can't enforce your boundaries. Now, if you're the kind of person who has all the answers, that's great. If you're the kind of person who needs answers from other people, it's not so awesome because you get stuck waiting on somebody else. But if you're the one who's the stucky as it were, like the one, yeah. who, the one who helps somebody get unstuck, it, it gets, it's more empowering. So it's like, it's got that inversion. Like it's got that inversion of the sort of the classic power relationship you see in an office. Yeah. Um, but it's not better. It's just the 50% the other, it, it's just different. So sure. 50% the other way. It is fairly engineer friendly though. Cause like there's no way around the fact that like writing software, debugging problems, like, yeah, maybe you're like pair programming and working with somebody else, but like no fooling, you got to concentrate and people stopping by or chit chatting or wanting to interrupt you to ask questions. It doesn't help get it done. It just makes it, it just makes it take longer. Yeah. yeah. I also think mm. about like in that, environment, right? I'm, I'm here. I'm fully focused on this task at hand. I can do it anytime that I want with less interruptions. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, I feel like for those people in that role, yeah, I mean, I feel like they're as happy as they can be. They've got all the things that they want. And then I think about like me, which I'm weird because in a sales role, I always, Sure, I, I I would take my day working from the the house, mm-hmm. but I enjoyed the not only the camaraderie, but you know being in the office with mm-hmm. everyone and the excitement of like oh someone just just got a deal and things like that. Do you know on the sales side, do they have things that are in place to kind of 
create some of that excitement and, and keep the, the sales team motivated and moving towards your, your end goals? Uh, we have a few. I mean, we have you know, Slack channels where we celebrate wins. I send out a weekly weekly digest email of basically here's all the deals that happened and thanking everybody for getting stuff done. So there's there's relatively high levels of communication about it. Uh, the kinds of folks who are successful in higher ed sales are the kinds of folks who are really patient and don't need constant celebration because it, it ain't go that fast. Yeah. So like there's, there's fast paced sales environments where you build that momentum. And it's got that feel to it. Higher ed sales is about put your rum on the ship and send it off to a foreign land. Yeah. I've, back I've never them. in my life. Yeah. You've got to like, like you've got to have the resolve to do like, like we, uh, Chris Neenan, who's my head of sales. Now we're looking at this, um, journal that, you know, from Salesforce of like how many calls we were doing okay. in order to do this one deal he and I are working on together. And we're up to 15 and we think it's going to be 30 meetings before the deal's done. Wow. And we think that's average. Average. Yeah. And, wow. And there's a, there's a lot of products where the idea that you'd have 30 conversations with the customer individually, small groups, then again, talk to, se- to five to seven different stakeholders to figure out their part of the problem yeah. and then show them a proposal where, Hey, this is a solution to five different executive stakeholders at your institution's problem. Here's how it comes together and we can solve it. And, you know, do that kind of like, what was it? Uh, Kissinger shuttle diplomacy. Like you go talk to everybody individually, figure out what their problem is, make sure you have a solution to it, bring it back together and then show them here. Cool. I can solve all your problems. All your problems. Yeah. yeah. That, like that's really what it takes is, uh, and that's a bit, that's a big, that's a complicated sales cycle. You know, I've got, yeah. friend, I've got friends who've got lead to close in 30 days on compliance software that I'm like an investor in. And I'm like, yeah. wow, I wish I had your sales cycle. This is great. Like the lead comes in, you assign it to someone, they call the customer, they do a demo, three calls to close. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I can even think mm-hmm. of my own sales career and 20 years of sales. And if I were to, to guesstimate average mm-hmm. seven touches, seven, to, yeah. you know, I can remember one particular one. It was actually one of the biggest deals I ever closed in my career. And it took like 15, 15. Yeah. 15. And it was one of those where I thought, Mm -hmm. you know, I feel like this person showed enough interest. I'm going to keep going Mm -hmm. and then got it. But to, to tell me that that's the average, totally normal. And then, and that's just to get the customer all the way to the S and then you go into the exciting world of purchasing and procurement in these big public institutions, then that's a whole nother and set of stakeholders. dealing with the grants and the... I think you're, and, and oftentimes the buyer has limited experience purchasing, and so they have to learn their own purchasing process. Uh, and oftentimes the purchasing process is being actively changed uh, while things are going on. And so figuring <laughs> that out. So like even when you're done, you're not done. You're, you actually got a whole nother process you're running. Uh, and then there's like legal and contracts. Like it's, it's actually pretty, it's pretty complicated as sales go. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. And all it's I, not the easy part. That's all of that, and y'all still have mm-hmm. very happy employees. You're taking care of everyone. Can you tell me? Do you know like retention numbers? I'd love to. I'm just curious, maybe on a, an employee side, but even on the the customer side. You know, I I don't know those off the top of my head on the employee side because we haven't re- recalculated them recently on the customer side you know think of it as like like gross and net retention and it's like you know it's in the 90 percent range on, on, yeah. the, on an annual basis which is pr- pretty good for like we're like not the system of record so like there's a lot of softwares that have 100 percent retention that's usually because people can't leave not yeah. because people love them yeah right like if all your data is in there whether you like you get the, you get on sale, you get on salesforce you ain't leaving yeah whether you like it or not and most people don't love it so like the system, the system of record is a little bit, little bit stickier. We're, we're, we're a derivative system, so it's a little bit harder. So people can choose to come and go with us, right? No, that's yeah. fascinating. So as we kind of nearing the, the end of our time here, a couple more things. That first one I always like to ask is, can you think of anything, whether for Civitas or you personally, professionally, that you're interested, excited to plug? Maybe some thing y'all are working on or maybe a new new book that you've gotten into that you'd like to share um you know the one that's been interesting to me is this demographics information like uh, uh Zirin's book that came out the end of the world it's just the beginning or maybe get his, his title a little bit mixed and, up he's been around plugging it quite a bit he's actually getting to be quite famous and what's the author's name um what is Zirin's first name i can't remember his first interest Zirin with a or, z or zahan yeah Peter Peter Zahn, yeah. Okay. Um, 
the demographic shift that's going on in the world, and this actually is totally pertinent to, to higher ed, like specifically, yeah. where like populations are absolutely aging in the entire northern hemisphere, with the exception of the uh, essentially the Middle East, um, and so you've got a d declining supply of student age population. He's thinking about it from like standpoint of globalization um, and trade and industry. I'm thinking about it in terms of like, well, you've got this big demographic cliff pending 2025 like you know college age on from the 2008 mm -hmm. downturn in birth rates and like what is that you know what does that world look like um, you're seeing it now play out and you know I was talking to a couple of investment bankers a month ago There's the conversation amounted to I don't understand why <laughs> unemployment is so low and then that's like I'm like did, did did you did you miss how many people retired in the yeah, last yeah. two years and then like Whoops, an extra, you know, I mean, not to be super flip about it, but like two million extra people, excess deaths in like the last three years. Yeah. And then, oh, wait, opioid crisis. Like there's, you know, there's like a lot of pressure on, there's a lot of pressure on the economy that's unique right now. Um, that's demographic. It's not like technological. Yeah. And I think that's, that's pretty interesting. And people thinking about, thinking about that one and what the yeah, world's going to look like. Yeah, that's a fascinating read for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. That's pretty interesting. Um, that, that's one I've been trying to figure out because it, it, it kind of relates to everything, but it definitely relates to, to what's going on in higher ed. Yeah. Wow. All right. Um, Jason, you got that. Peter Zian. I want to check that out. It's worth a read. Yeah. Uh, as my CTO said, uh, don't read it right before bed because it can be a little, it can be, a little, <laughs> it can, it can be it could be a little scary. I mean, not like not like horror book, but like yeah. a little bit like, oh man, the world is going to be gonna Glo be crazy. A little like, gloom and doom, scary. A little, little gloom and doom. You sure. may not be able to get sleep. Okay. Um, but, Noted. But it is pretty interesting. Yeah. Noted. All right. Um, one thing I want to do is now uh, we sent you a little bit of homework before, and you uh, we appreciate you taking five minutes to do mm -hmm. that behavioral assessment. Have you done any of those assessments oh, before? Oh, bunches, like big company hiring. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's actually increasingly common yep. in uh, private equity yep. uh, staff assessment. And then we do, I can't remember the name of the vendor. I wish I did. They're pretty good. Um, what I call it the sales IQ test. Yeah. So we, we have a vendor who actually runs a personality and sales skill assessment for new sales hires. So we, we actually use this kind of stuff a lot. Okay. But just on the sales team? Just on the sales team. Okay. Yeah. On the, on the engineering side, I have a system I have another system yeah. um, that I've, I've given talks about and done for, for quite a long time. That's actually more focused on assessing people's ability to do the actual job rather than their interview skills. So we or do on the cognitive side. Well, no, it's actually show and tell. Like, like my favorite interview format is hi engineer, bring a project of your own. I see. Show okay. Us. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, like, that's something the that they built themselves. Something that they built built themselves, or with nice. friends, or an open source project they contribute okay. to. Like something that's not, well, something they have rights to. Like they, sure, they, sure. They can't be like, I brought the code from work. Like no, please don't. Like, yeah. I've had a few interviews. Where I'm like, no, really. Like that's not yours. I know you wrote it, but like you you, you don't, don't you that. don't have the rights to show me that unless yeah. you have like a note from your boss or something. Like you know, <laughs> okay. you want to do that. Um, so that like that's actually been very effective and do what is in effect of a, a code review of their and their presentation of their software is, you know, okay. that one's been very effective for me there. There's not a lot of jobs you can do that with. I mean, like salespeople will do the, like, sell me this pencil kind of like, it's sort of silly. It doesn't really, it yeah, doesn't yeah. really work as an interview. I hate that because like you don't sell pencils. So, it, and you don't sell like that and nobody sells oh, yeah. like that. I hate yeah. That. But the show me real work that you've been doing over a long period of time is actually much more. And like, and then you can simultaneously test, Hey, do they love programming enough that they do it besides at work? Sure. But it turns out that's a big factor. Uh, yeah. Can they talk about it? Can they talk about it with a group and not be, you know, defensive and weird? Can they show and describe what they're working on from like a product standpoint, not just an engineering standpoint? Um, can they type? Can they use their computer? Like, like, like you be, like, this is less true now, but <laughs> like back in the day, like you do this kind of exercise to uh, interview engineers and you would find folks that like couldn't get their laptop connected to the projector, couldn't like they're running their editor. Yeah, and I can't type. And I'm like, oh, this is not gonna be fun. Yeah, like, this is gonna be really frustrating for whoever you're working with. But you can see that viscerally in the interview by with with the simple show and tell format works really well. No, I love that. So the the assessment that you took is powered by the psychometric data mm -hmm. of the predictive index. Uh, and I'm not sure what level of 
you know, maybe interaction or, or knowledge you've had of predictive index. Now, Jason and I are both what predictive index calls a maverick. And I feel like we don't even have to, I don't even really have to tell you what a maverick is. Mm-hmm. And you can be like, oh, okay, I, I get you guys. <laughs> um, and you came in as one I've only seen a couple of other times. And predictive index calls you an individualist. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious if you relate to any of this. Um, some of the things that you need a lot of flexibility is, uh, is a big one. Uh, definitely needing like freedom from a rigid structure. Like you, you need to be able to, to, to do whatever the hell you want. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to kind of blaze your, your own path. Um, let me know if I'm uh, off on any of these, but then also like needing the challenge and needing, needing the independence, but also needing the challenge and needing to, to be able to, to kind of bounce off of other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't know if any of those make sense or if any of those are like, no, I don't, no, I don't I think, think that's me. Sense. I mean, I, I it may be so individualist that the way it's written of like needing like as, as an English sentence that actually has an implication that someone would give it to you or allow it to you. And I'm like, no, no, it's power is something you take. Yeah. Yeah. Like you just, if you, want it you do it sure you don't ask okay so maybe yeah. even slightly more like my patron saint is the marlboro man level of <laughs> individualist right yeah. now like how does that play into your leadership style would you say um a thing that i will say very commonly to like folks who work for me is i'll tell them what the goal is whatever the goal is here's what the metrics are here's how much money you can spend don't break the law have fun i love it so like I'm not a like I've got I usually have what I call my own stupid plan. So like if someone gives me a no, then I'll tell them like, OK, great. Let's do my plan. I'm not pretending my plan's good. I'm just using it to make you think of a better one because you don't want to do my stupid plan. Yeah. Um, so like that's something that's a pretty common interaction with me. And then the other one I'll do is my uh, one is an ultimatum two is a dilemma three. You're actually choosing. So whenever there's a decision, like, de- like deliberately have the conversation go long enough that you generate at least three possible options to choose between and then choose between those as opposed to like, the only thing we can do is X, like, nah, you can always just lay on the floor and ignore it. So there's yeah. always at least one more option, right? Wow. Um, Will you say those three again? Ultimatum? So ultimatum, dilemma, and now you're actually making a choice. Yeah. I should come up with a better word for the last no, one. No, I love like, that. It's like, boom, boom, blah, yeah. in terms of like not a professional speech writer. So like maybe it could be just a decision. Yeah. It could be, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. I, mm-hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Um, that now, one's actually a use that, that you can use that practice of like making sure there's at least three choices in almost every setting. Yeah. Like that, that's not even just a business rule. That one actually works out really well. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. And it helps, helps keep you from feeling trapped because that dilemma thing shows up a lot. Like people will try to frame, Choices to you is you must do this or that. Like, ah, no way. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. And would, is that something that you kind of derived from something else and made your own? Or did you just come up with that on your own? Or do you remember? I don't know where I picked that up. Okay. From. Like, I remember doing that even as far back, like, re, you know, like young, like 12, 14, 16, if someone would say, like, you have to do X or Y. I'm like, well, no, I don't. I can do this and this and this also. Okay. Um, which is maybe, you know adolescence arguing. So it's not so much philosophy as it is being yeah. like what 14 year old boy logic. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm into it. I mean, I, I de- <laughs> that's how my brain, where I'm like, yeah. I don't have to I don't have to do that. Like there's gotta be more choices. Than yeah, this. yeah. You can't No, um, no way. So, but, but, but harvesting the ideas of like everybody you're working with. So it's not just like my stupid idea. Yeah. That, that usually makes it more fun. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Will Ballard. Wow. What a fascinating talk. Um, I, one thing I want to go off on it's, um, our, favorite way to end every episode and it's a little bit of this or that so <laughs> i'm gonna list two things you quick fire just uh, first first thing that comes to mind um i'm excited for this one video games or books Ooh, 50 <laughs> 50 yeah okay like i don't play a ton of games anymore um and i probably read less than i used to now because my life's full of spreadsheets and email sure um but it's always been like traditionally it's always been pretty balanced okay and on that note, are you a PC gamer or a console? Oh, when it's games, it's PC games because okay. it's big, big strategy games, which yeah. are honestly kind of like running a business, but it's a game. Like okay. Sort of, in a lot of ways, very similar. It's like resource management and yeah. allocation and strategy. But yeah, okay. the, like it, 
Oh, only like big scary strategy games. Okay, I love it. Uh, soda or juice? Mm, neither. Too much sugar. Water. I get fat I, enough from drinking wine. So, okay. Uh, uh, sand or snow? Sand. Sand. All right. Yeah. Um, playing or coaching? Oh, playing. Playing. Okay. Yeah. And then last one: dogs or cats? Uh, dogs. We have five. Do we, we do have, have four, five? Do we do have four cats? Four okay. Ones. I mean, we got a lot. We lot of space. We're way out in the country. All right. Uh, but the dogs are technically up by one at the moment. Yeah. One dogs five cats four. Mm-hmm. I love it. All right. Any final thoughts before we go? No, it's great. All right. Well, this has been the uh, Work Cultured Podcast with Will Ballard of Civitas Learning. Really appreciate you being here today, Will. Thanks. And, uh, uh, we are signing off. <laughs>